Fields of Glory is the best war game in a generation. <laughs> well, that may be, but we're here to talk some Dragon Magazine. No, you need to buy a PC and play it. Oh, well, okay. How about I uh, get a job before I start buying computers? Okay. Yeah. But then get it. Then buy a PC and get it. We'll see what we can do. Um, right. So, uh, fans and friends and whoever else happened to stumble across this, uh, I, it, Jim, how is Dragon Up the Past for a, uh, a, a title? Does that work for you? It does. It does. I was, I was thinking of Dragon Through the Past, but uh, the uh, Dragon Up the Past is absolutely what we're doing. As long as we're not dragging ass, I guess we'll be okay. Um, <laughs> it certainly doesn't feel like it. No. The, uh, I, I hope we're, we're okay with that name, because that's the one that I slapped on the first two episodes of this video thing that we're doing here. Um, but we're, a, lot, uh, lot of thi- lot, a lot of things start that way. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of what happened with the Grogheads name in the first place. <laughs> um, well. That's a bit of an interesting story of brainstorming. Uh, not one for this show necessarily, but we'll tell that tale one of these days. Um, we, uh, so, so, uh, Jim and I are both denizens of the Grogheads forums, and we are slowly taking a tour through the collected archives of Dragon Magazine, roughly number one through about 200 or so, uh, so yeah, we, we got a whole lot of these things to do. Um, we've, uh, we've knocked out a couple issues already, and this one we are doing a deep dive backwards into number 16, back before Dragon had even really settled on a logo. Because <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would love to know. This is this is these are the glory days. I mean, when you're just when you're just dreaming and you're an idea, you've only got what forty pages here is what I'm looking at. It's not a lot, and and it's, it's and and yet they put up this crazy logo with the 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 sedil off the G forming into the head of a snake. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh it's all sorts of symbolic up there in the logo. Um, See if we can't enlarge ourselves here slightly. And, uh, yeah, all sorts of interesting graphical choices here uh, with the logo. So, uh, anyhow, we're not here just to, to psycho-examine the logo and, uh, you know, sort of draw conclusions about the state of the artist's relationship with his mother. Um, let's let's actually sort of maybe dig into the, uh, the issue itself a little here. Um, so, we've got inside the front cover... The Fantasy Air Cavalry. This is back when people had no problem whatsoever mixing and matching role-playing and wargaming terms as they uh, as they went through. Um, well, that is absolutely one of the themes that we like to talk about, which is, hey, folks, this division that we sometimes think is, is inherent in our hobby is a fiction. Uh, it may be a product of the fact that we've succeeded so well, that now everybody can play whatever they want with whomever they want. But back in the day, in the glory days of June 1978, and I remember that summer well, uh, there was there was a lot of cross-pollination between the two. So there they are, the air, the air cavalry. But and, and if all you need to know, just roll down to the bottom of this same ad. They This is Ralph Partha, makers of the Hoplites, Days of the Empire, American Civil War, and Desert Rats, along with fantasy role playing and fantasy war games. So it's and, great. and Empire of the Petal Throne. Oh yes, yes. Which I, I wonder, does that still have resonance? Because oh, when no. I was when, no. when I was coming up, Empire of the Petal Throne was the thing. No, that was, not at all. Everybody knew Tolkien, right? <laughs> okay. No, it, everybody, it, everybody knew Tolkien. People under thirty have no idea what that is. Okay. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. And, and most people between 30 and 40 probably only have a cursory idea of what it is. It's only us old farts over 40. And, and quite frankly, um, I'm, I'm solidly in the mid-40s, and it was already starting to fade as I was coming up as a role player in the early 80s. No, that's right. No, you're right about that, because I actually had the same experience, and I'm north of 50. So barely north, but still north. And as a consequence, you know, you, you've got to realize this was a very, very big deal. This was something I think, and its resonance always to me was, hey, over there is Lord of the Rings. We're something different. Play this other thing. And it was it was more complex. It was more uh, in detail. But no, that's, uh, yeah, that's Ralph Partha, all those minis. Look at them. Yes. Well, at the time, you know, for a long time, they were the name in minis. So, um, oh, oh, my God. 
Clearly, oh, that's changed some. Uh, I, I, I scrolled forward a page, and I almost had a stroke. <laughs> Two important new releases from TSR. Here is Gamma World, right? D&D in the nuclear post-atomic <laughs> world. Um, it, 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 let, let's face it, Gamma World was quite silly. Um, but it was so much fun. Uh, oh. <laughs> at, oh, at the time, yeah, nobody I... knew what it was going to be. They just, Gamma World, what the hell is this Gamma World thing? Um, but, but yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the new releases. And the other one, the AD&D Player's Handbook. The, and, and because only Gary Gygax could write this copy... The authoritative manual of character races, abilities, classes, alignments, and much more. And bear in mind, folks, this is the one. This is the hardback with the, the idol getting its eye popped out on the front. So this is some really oor stuff here. But no, to Gamma World, first of all, we, we've talked a little bit about font design and page layout. That's a, that's a great font choice for Gamma World up there. Nothing evokes the future. Like, what is the name of that font? Because it's still around. Uh, I'm not sure, and barely. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, people forget that Gamma World, for a generation, was really a popular game. It was probably my number three, only because I divided D&D &D separately from Greyhawk. Yeah. And then there was Gamma World. And Gamma World was the place where my friends, at least would go to kind of blow off, blow off steam, if you will, from the grind of real fantasy in Dungeons and & Dragons and do absurd stuff in Gamma World. And it's just a, it's a great setting. Uh, it's a great system. Uh, so much, wow, Origin 78. There we go. Yep. And, and Gen Con in 78 as well. Well, and there's, I, I see, I'm, I'm peeking at the table of contents and I know we're going to have a uh, Gen Con preview and update, so I can't wait. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this this issue is a whole 40 pages. There was a note in here I wanted to, to, to draw to people's attention. Due to the length of the conclusion of The Green Magician. So it's not just fiction, it's multi-issue fiction. We found it necessary to add an extra four pages to this issue. Contrary to what some Philistines might think, this is not a fiction magazine. <laughs> And yet, we looked at one, I mean, that we've done issues in the hundreds that still had fiction in them. And, Absolutely. And, and quite deservedly so. I mean, there was some great fiction about this, and, and let's face it, I mean, most of us, many of us at least, were drawn to the fantasy worlds by, by some fiction that, uh, that helped light our imagination for, for the things we were interested in looking at. Um, the other really interesting tidbit on this page... Take a look at the creativity in wargaming. <laughs> oh my goodness, are you kidding me? This, this is once again... First of all, read how to and who may vote. Yes. Yes. Not, not only... So anyone reading this in any of the fine magazines running, it is eligible to vote, but only once. To that end, you must include your name and address somewhere on the ballot. Remember back when people had no problem giving up their name and address and not expecting to be deluged with junk mail? <laughs> right, because, well, and frankly, because there was nobody on the other end to load your name into an absurd database. Yes, which was then stolen by a bunch of Russian spammers. Right. <laughs> but not only exactly. that, keep, keep in mind, we are looking at the creativity in wargaming votes in Dragon Magazine. Now, well, I'm sure these I were in many other magazines as well, but the fact that they thought to include it in Dragon was kind of interesting. It is, it, is, it is not clear to me at all. There's so much here. I'm, I'm sort of overloading because I try not to read these in advance because <laughs> I, I love the surprise. But let's let's try just a couple of things. First of all, what in the blue blazes is the fourth annual strategist? What what is the strategist club? Yeah, I, I have no idea. What what is that? I again, it, it's it's a thing. <laughs> I mean, you're allowed. Clearly, you're in it if you're reading Dragon 16. So that's cool. But. It, it's, it seems to be anybody that wants to be in it. So it's it's made up. It's As the kids would say today, that's not a thing. Well, and, and part of what I'm wondering here is if these awards, and, and perhaps somebody in the know can shoot us a note, or we will discover it along our way flipping through additional Dragon magazines, I'm wondering if these aren't the precursors to the Charlies, 
the uh, the Charles S. Roberts Awards that that were sort of the prestige awards for the wargaming community for a long time, um, and for the last like three years have completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, and, and so I'm I'm curious if these are perhaps uh, an early precursor to that. I did want to kind of draw your attention to a couple of the options in the voting. Oh, for, yes. for 1977 Outstanding Game Air War by SPI, the game that I've never found someone who has completed two consecutive turns of that game. Thank you. This is that was the. You remember, I said I had a whole bunch of things that leapt up at me. <laughs> this <laughs> is almost a perfect. Which of these things is not like the other? Yeah. Because you've got you've got uh, ogre, obviously an absolute classic. A you, squad leader. You have really? four classics right there: ogre, Rival. squad leader, victory in the Pacific, and war of the ring. And war of the ring. These are these are absolute. Any one of those five, those those bottom five are absolutely priceless games. And you link them to air war, which I own, but is so bad. It is, it, there's, you know, it was one of those early attempts to make modern jet combat make sense. And, you know, well, TL colon DR, it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, not just that. It, and, it's and he, modern jet combat on a tabletop is very hard to make sense of. Now, there are, there are ones that do it better than others. But let's face it, that's one of those things you need a computer to do. <laughs> yeah, um, well, at, at the dogfight level that they were trying to do it. Or put it another way, why wouldn't you let a computer do it? Yes, yes. You know, so, um, but yeah, so that's so great. I mean, okay, so what's yours? I'm, I'm curious. What is your, out of the group, we've obviously going to punt Air War and Imperium. Imperium's a good game, but it doesn't belong with the other five. Of those five, although, again, this is their overall outstanding game, so let's, let's yes. bear that in mind. But which is yours? Uh, squad Leader. And, and not just for everything that came after it in terms of it becoming the the 800-pound behemoth in the wargaming hobby. Squad Leader, really, the, the, the key thing that Squad Leader brought to the gaming world that thus far people in wargaming hadn't paid enough attention to. And I'm not going to say nobody had done it before Squad Leader, but nobody did it as well as Squad Leader in a game that turned out that popular. And that was the importance of morale at the small unit level. And, and look, we could do like four podcasts in a row on just how to deal with that, that one issue. Squad Leader took how to deal with morale at the small unit cohesion level and its level of importance in, in those micro-tactical engagements. Figured out how to make it relevant in the game. Figured out how to make it important in the game. Figured out how to make it playable in the game, which is a key right there. I mean, Air War... Figured out how to quantify a ton of stuff, but it was completely unplayable. Squad Leader figured out how to do all of that in a way that made sense. And and so, this is not to knock Ogre. This is not to knock Victory in the Pacific or War of the Ring. Look, let's face it. Like you said, those bottom five, those are tentpole events for any game convention today. Right? I mean, yeah, right. we're, no, we're, and, we're almost and, 40 I, years later, and any one of those is a tentpole event for a game convention today. But but Squad Leader really revolutionized particular facets of wargaming, and and those need to be recognized. And the only one, the only the only one I would put up against it would have been if Victory in Pacific would have been War at Sea, to which it is the sequel. I think it would have been able to bat with it, but it is a sequel. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, those are Look, it, one, sequels can be excellent, right? Right. Empire Strikes Back was a sequel. <laughs> That's a great question. We ought to, I'm going to make a little note here on the side, and I'm going to go back to the Origins and Gen... Well, not so much Gen Con, but I'm going back to the Origins game catalog for this year and see how many of those games actually were played at Origins. I will guarantee you Traveler was. I know Squad Leader certainly as ASL was. Ogre was. I saw it. Victory in the Pacific was. The only one I don't know is, is The Great War of the Ring yeah. by, by SPI. But think of that. I mean, that's that's quite a testament to the endurance of that design. We are now, I don't know if you planned it this way, but we're now 40 years after the fact, and those are games still being played. That's oh, yeah. That's a thing. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's two other things I want to draw just quick attention to on this page, and then we got to keep moving because, you know, Lord knows we wouldn't want to rush through one of these things. Um, 
first of all, down at the bottom on the left column, Outstanding Miniatures Rules 1977. We had enough new minis rules being dropped every year that we had to select, you know, we, we had to winnow them down the, to get to the Outstanding Minis Rules of that year. Um, and look at the bottom one, Legends of the Petal Throne. <laughs> but but look, what, look what's right over it. Modern Armor from TSR. Yeah. And go up to a rule set I have, Cordite and Steel. TSR. Yes. The, you and, mean, of course, and of course, Fantasy Games Unlimited. Well, I was going to say, you mean the Tactical Studies rules guys made rules for Tactical Studies? <laughs> Who'd have thunk? Um, yeah, so. the, the other thing just to draw attention to, over in the Fantasy Gaming Hall of Fame, you'll notice the, the both the posthumous and the living authors. These guys are all fantasy authors. Like, there's there's not a game designer in the crowd. <laughs> well, Fletch, well, Fletcher Pratt is. Yes. Um, but, but not necessarily known purely as a game designer. Like, it... If you had any of those books on your shelf in your library, and as I'm recording this, I'm actually sitting in my library instead of the game den. Um, I know that sounds really pretentious, but our downstairs room has a whole bunch of built-in shelves, and so we've, we've got all our books down here, and we call it the library. Um, the, you know, the, this, is, the, this is a who's who of your fiction library, of, of the you know, well-read gamers' fiction collection. And, and I, you got to love any, you know, the, one of the first things my eyes were drawn to, how do you not love somebody who wants to give a, an award to Lord Dunsinane? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and before we split, I just want to observe the guy, the guy, whatever you think of him, Outstanding Game Design, 1977, War of the Ring, Howard Barish, and, and Richard, Richard Burr. Burr. God <laughs> almighty, that guy. Yeah. The other thing I do find interesting is Squad Leader, they credit John Hill and Don Greenwood. Yes. It, John Hill's Which, the guy who's famous for creating Squad Leader. It is rare that you see Don Greenwood co-credited. Right. Not, and, not that he's not worthy of, you know, any accolades well, anyone ever throws him in the wargaming world. <laughs> but I have seen John speak to this, and he fully credits Don. Yeah. You know, so that's... your. But your your point is absolutely correct. I mean, when John passed away... A little while ago, it was very much, oh, we have lost the man who did Squad Leader. But I thought at the time, not that I felt the need to say it much, that, that Don, too, he was he was absolutely there. But uh, Squad Leader is ultimately John's story. Yes. You know, he was, John is making a point. It yeah. was a, and, and he makes it brilliant. Um, in our letters to the editor, a rebuttal to the Cthulhu Mythos Revisited. Um, guys, I, this I is... I like the fact, can I, can I start... Read the opening sentence. I was just going to say, this is an internet message board on paper. <laughs> uh, but, well, I like, to, first of all, never, ever start your letters with well. All yeah. right? Just, don't do it. Don't do it. Well, when one gets into a religious controversy, but no, it's the Thulu, it's the Thulu missiles. It's not a religious controversy. It isn't. Well, okay? it, it is to some people. If you hung out with some of the Cthulhu folks. <laughs> Stop it. It's not, you know, it's like, no. And secondly, and I read through this briefly while you were discussing something else, it's delightful. If we could exhume H.P. Lovecraft, he'd probably like it. Uh, but if we could exhume him, he didn't think this deliberately about his mythology. Oh, no. He just no. didn't. I... He, just, he was the writer for The Working Day, and a great one, a classic. But he wasn't Tolkien in the incredibly anal way he crafted his fiction. Let, let's face it, if we were to exhume, you know, if, if we were going to dig him up, let, let, let's face it, right, he's nuts. There's no way he put this intentional level of detail into anything he wrote because he's nuts. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so, so that's, that letter just got me going. No, it's, it's entertaining. For folks who can dig up their own Dragon 16, absolutely recommend you do it. Um, all right. The Near Eastern Mythos. Now well, you you made the comment about this in our last get together, and we're, we're we've now gone deeper to the source of this problem. Well, remember, folks, up top <laughs> we, saw, we saw we we don't have the A D and D character. We don't have the player's handbook yet. Yeah. So we certainly don't have deities and demigods. Well, and and, yet, and, and here we have people putting stats on deities. Now, here's one thing I do want to say. This is one of the reasons I grabbed this particular issue. 
uh, because it was relatively recent to our discussion uh, about your good buddy and we're going to fight Pazuzu. Pazuzu's not in here. I was a little disappointed. What? He's not in here. If he's here, he's under a different name. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I don't. I, I, that's, that's, that, well, I did, well, that's very nice of you. Thank you for doing that. But it's, uh, I can't. We do have the God of Mass Destruction. Which is good. We do have the ruler of the netherworld. Right? There's the Mesopotamian goddess of death. Right? There is the Canaanite god of death and sterility. I find it interesting that those two are combined. Um, Isn't that totally surprised? But, but we did not have Pazuzu anywhere. I, I did look. That is the... Uh, that He makes, according to this, Pazuzu the deity, and I'm, you know, God bless the bound copy of Wikipedia we can all take down from our shelf. <laughs> Uh, he makes his first appearance in the first edition Monster Manual 2. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's that would be the first canonical appearance. It wouldn't surprise me if he had appeared before then in that's a weird. Dragon magazine. Well, now, now you've set me up. Now, from now on, we are on Pazuzu Patrol. <laughs> we are going to find the... the I, you know, and, and, by the way, you know, as, as afterlifes go, Ishulana has it going good. The gardener of Anu. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know, that's, he was loved by Ishtar, rejected her, yeah. and was then turned into a frog, which, you know, usually goes that way. But again, gardener of Anu. This is, you, you got to have goals, and this may be one of mine now. Yeah. Uh, hashtag death goals. Not life goals, huh? Right, death right. goals. <laughs> Next life goals. Yeah. <laughs> You, uh, you also notice a, a, a stunning lack of internal artwork here. How many of these things are crying out for a bad back-of-the-notebook pencil sketch that could have been drafted yes. into our Dragon Magazine art archives here, and yet we have none? Well, and also, if you look over at Archive Miniatures to the right there, you can actually see where they put the clip down, and you can see the frame around the clip because it blends poorly into the background. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we also have the ultimate NPC. So here's where the ninja starts to show up in uh, in D and D games, and uh, and the world was ruined ever since because everybody wanted to be a ninja. Because dang it, those guys are cool. No, 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 they're evil killers, right? <laughs> um, well, but no, they're cool. Let, they're in lots of kung fu it. movies. Let, I'm going to have to make this. This is going to be Brant's law. This is going to be Bayonet's law. Oh boy. Find me nope that it's it the law reads nobody took a character for one of these side classes up through the level of Shigo, Bushi, Genin, Chunin, oh, yeah. and Jonin. Didn't happen. But number two, so that's that's the law. We're just gonna assume that about these characters. How does D and D break this way? The editor's introduction to this piece. In recent weeks, we've received a number of requests for more detailed and developed information to including campaigns. Awesome. Got a, here it is, the DM's hitman, in quotes. Yeah. Got a crew of two powerful NPCs? What, what, how do you, what DM doesn't know? I, you know, I was just listening to the last Grogcast, and I was listening to, um, you know, the discussions of dealing with your party, even from somebody who isn't necessarily the best storyteller out there. You know, we, we had that confession come from our guy from down south of the Mason-Dixon. And when you... Who loses control of their group that way? That they feel like, oh my God, my group is out of control. Please, De Dragon Magazine, give me a character to help. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh... Yeah, you, you've got a few too many Monty Hall players in your crew at that point. And uh, and you did it to yourself because you're the DM that keeps giving them stuff. But this is this is where they come from, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Summer of '78. What so, was the number one song in America? July of 1978. Uh, well, that's the height of disco, so probably something embarrassing. I. <laughs> it is okay. I can stipulate that it is something embarrassing. <laughs> uh, is, Donna Summer. It is not a disco song. It's a show tune. Oh, really? Now, now I'm scared. <laughs> Previously, I was intrigued. At this point, I'm scared. Just lay it on us. Hopelessly devoted to you from Greece. Olivia Newton-John. I actually, this is going to be sad. I, I know how to play that guitar riff. 
Um, oh, oh dear. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> I I love this one. There are no ninja levels higher than level sixteen. Any ninja may advance to this level to that level. There's there's nothing else in this article indicating why a ninja otherwise wouldn't have been able to advance to that level. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's, that's... ninja families are headed by one Jonin. The same person may be Jonin to more than one family. I'm curious. Uh, does that mean you're stuck at level ten? You know, like each family only has one person from level ten to sixteen. What has so so you're stuck at level nine? You could have like eleven guys at level nine just sort of stuck there waiting for the level ten guy to finally age out of being an active ninja. I mean, it's you know that is wow. That okay. I'm no no. I'm still stuck on your first point. How come not? Yeah. <laughs> why 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 not? And, yeah. and and parenthetically, well, I suppose they're saying any ninja may advance to this level because you have the business with a monk. Who I guess. Only a, there's only one monk above a certain level up to level twenty. Yeah. Level twenty. So it's I, I suppose that's why they're throwing that in there. But well, but here's your here's your challenge with that. When does the monk make his appearance? I oh get your God. reasoning. However, the monk makes his initial appearance. In the player's handbook, right? I mean, I don't know for certain that he's not in Dragon Magazines 1 through 15. But let's assume not. The monk makes his initial appearance in the the AD&D player's handbook, which hasn't dropped yet because we saw the ad saying, hey, this is coming up. <laughs> so while your no, reasoning that's... is sound, your, your, you know, your chronological time bar is a little twisted there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's a, it's, I wonder... Because I've never been engaged by this character type and class. It's never been anything I've liked. Yeah. So I, I don't know, but my goodness, how much of D&D &D did this one article inflect? Yeah, who knows? Uh, the That's Judges something. Guild advertisement. Not only are there Judges Guild products, they are also selling Avalon Hill games. Okay, I can't handle that part of the page. I have to look away. <laughs> because are you telling me... And I realize these are nineteen seventy eight dollars. Don't get me wrong, but oh my God, Squad Leader! There it is, twelve, 12 bucks American bucks. Oh. You can pick and up seventeen seventy six for ten. And there, no, but there it is. Outdoor Survival was a twelve dollar premium. Yeah. Oh, uh, so twelve. Oh gosh, Ta gosh, gosh, gosh. You need to look at that left hand column in the Judges Guild products. Tegel Manor was only four dollars and fifty cents. Oh my goodness. The first fantasy campaign by Dave Arneson. Yes. You could pay eight bucks and get some change back. Yeah, that that is not going to cost you four fifty anymore. <laughs> Assuming any you can find it. Uh, I saw a copy of it come up at auction, Gen Con a few years ago, and it it, it was in the benefit portion of the program, the one where they that were yeah. And I'm talking about Tangled Manor here. That sucker was that was expensive. Oh, I it I'm sure it went for three figures. Yeah, yeah. Did it make it to four? Uh, it was, I believe, Tegel Manor was five fifty. Yeah. Now part yeah. of that was charity. I get it, but yeah, that's not five point fifty, right? No, that's I mean, not, that's, no, that was not one dollar. The decimal extra. points after the zero. <laughs> just to yeah. clarify, the uh, Thursday night D and D game for Monty and the boys. I just love the piece of artwork down here. I'm not going to say a word about the uh, the article, the Monty Hall article there, but. I just love the artwork down there, the dagger with the cigar. That I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet you one dollar somebody's got that as a tattoo. Maybe I, I think it really belongs on the nose of a fighter plane. That would also be good. That, that, that's what that looks like to me. So, um, space squadrons, galactic conquest at your fingertips. There you go, space said, combat minis from Grimdeer well, Models. Once again, we are we are back to our black screen over the minis, trying to get anything approaching contrast on unpainted lead in black and white. Yes, yes, because there's a complete dearth of color on the interior pages here. Um, all right, so here's role playing realism versus game logic, and the man himself is going to talk to us. Well, <laughs> the. The, the, the thing that this calls to mind for me is we used to have a regular uh, lunchtime game group at one of the places I worked almost 10 years ago now. And, and there was a, uh, one of the guys was playing an elven archer, and we're probably all mid-level characters at this point, somewhere 8 to 10-ish. 
and and John's got this particular power that allows him to get off like three shots in one round. It's one of those. We were playing fourth edition D and D, and so it was like an encounter attack. I, I don't remember exactly. It might have been a daily. So John gets gets these three shots off super quick, except that the dragon that he's shooting at point blank range manages to bat all three of them away with a claw. Um, again, point blank range, elven archer of some skill. Um, gets three shots off, and the dragon manages to bat away all three arrows before any of them hit and actually inflict any damage. John's retort, Oh, that's not realistic. El Elven archer shooting at dragon, Oh, that's not realistic. Well, <laughs> the fact that he could bat the arrows away is the part that's apparently not realistic. Not the fact that you have an elven archer gets off three arrows in ten seconds shooting a dragon in the mouth. You know? I... I this is this is mind blowing to me. I have this article somewhere. I have this article stuffed into one of my many many books. Wow, and here's why. Wow, this is a full on screed from Gary Gygax, and I pulled this out as D and D began to declass, and as they began to and this is such a weird word. I'm using it strictly in a D and D sense. To deracinize. Used to be only humans could be paladins. Yeah. You could not have a dwarven paladin. Used to be wizards could never use swords. And when he went through all this class stuff, this is a this is the article that I used to point out that from Gary Gygax's perspective. You play the game as given. You don't mess around with it because you destroy the balance of the game. As I've aged and as I've looked at this, I've said, I don't know as I ever felt the game was balanced. I thought it was a vehicle to tell a story. Yeah. If, if I play a war game, if you and I sit down and we're going to play Fields of Glory, Field of Glory 2, which everybody should play... And if you're going to play that with me, I'll feel that one side is balanced or not. Or if we play a board war game, I'll judge whether it's balanced or not. I, I have never played a role-playing game with the hope that I would feel that it was balanced. Well, I always, I always felt that if my first-level magic user walks out and runs into three orcs, I'm going to be pounded into a bloody mist. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, and and again, I think part of it is not necessarily. You you mentioned, you know, are we playing a war game where things are balanced? And I'm I'm scrolling through this fairly slowly so that folks that have the hankering for it can like pause the video every now and then and kind of read some of this article here. Um, not that I'm expecting them to read it as we're narrating over it. Certainly, um, I I think one of the the issues there when you start talking about. Uh, how is it balanced as a whole? How does the game logic flow as a whole? Um, I think there's two different things going on there. You mentioned, you know, if we play a war game, you can tell pretty quickly whether or not it's balanced. Look, the Battle of Little Bighorn was never balanced, and it doesn't matter what kind of war game you make out of it. It's There's no balance there. Part of the, the balance in all of that is, are, are there achievable victory conditions for each such that... If one, you know, they, they both have an equal chance of, of achieving a particular victory condition. Same thing with the Alamo, right? I mean, the Texans are never, ever, ever going to win at the Alamo. That doesn't mean the Texans can't win a game about the Alamo if you set up the conditions such that victory is defined as surviving longer than they did historically, right? And, and at that point, you now have a balanced game, even though the, the balance of forces on the tabletop is obviously... Uh, completely out of whack. Same thing with any British versus Zulus war game you can possibly imagine. The Brits are screwed. <laughs> it's just too many Zulus running around. There's, There are ways in which you can balance role-playing games, not over an individual session, but over the life of the characters. Like you said, I expect the magic user to get his ass handed to him by three orcs when, when he's a first-level magic user. I expect the, the the 27th level magic user to sneeze and three orcs disappear. And so yes. over the course of a campaign, that balance may may eventually work itself out. 
But then Gary, and you've got this, there are two paragraphs here that I know I put heavy pen marks over on page 16. And it's the, the first one is he taught, he talks about why d d is designed the way it is and what he hates in variants on d d what are the and first he, couple of words of that paragraph so I can zoom in on it? Combat is the most frequently abused area. It's the last paragraph, left column, page 16. There we are. I just want to zoom in on it so that people can read along with us as you're, uh, as you're, you're venting. Oh, this is going to be venting. For here, many would-be, I love that, game inventors feel they have sufficient expertise to design a better system, by implication, than mine. Well, and, and interestingly enough, it's not like Gary had a ton of his own expertise before he started designing. Right. He's right. just like 12 iterations ahead of anybody else who's just starting right now. Last I checked, Gary wasn't an expert on, you know, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. No. Perhaps someone will eventually do so. But the examples to date are somewhat less than inspiring of confidence. And this is unreal. The, quote, critical hit, unquote which he's clearly dismissing with what a friend of mine calls dick quotes. <laughs> or double damage on a two-hit die roll of 20 is particularly offensive to the precepts of D&D. &D. Two reciprocal rules go, that go with such a system are seldom, if ever, mentioned. Opponents scoring a natural 20 will likewise call, cause double damage, and as a 20 indicated perfect hit, a 1 must indicate a perfect miss. And when these, when these additions are suggested, the matter is usually dropped, but the point must be made that the whole game system is what? Perverted. And the game possibly ruined. What? What? A roll 20 to hit is perverting D&D? &D? But it gets better. It gets better in the other column, on the other side of page 16. How far do I need to go here? But first of all, first of all, Gary wrote him some long paragraphs. Oh, yeah. Spell point systems are also currently in vogue among the fringe group, which haunt the pages of, quote, amateur press association, unquote, publications. Now, APAs are generally beneath contempt for the typify the lowest form of vanity press. There one finds pages and pages of banal chatter, and inept writing. So this is like Reddit. Uh, from persons <laughs> in, incapable of creating anything which is publishable elsewhere. Holy cheaper scary. Therefore they pay money to tout their sophomoric ideas, criticize those who are able to write a design, and generally make themselves obnoxious. I, I think you missed some emphasis there. Therefore they pay money to tout their sophomoric ideas, criticize those who are able to design, write and design. Right, a completely <laughs> superfluous jerk move italicization. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, if those goodness. were dick quotes, that's sort of asshole italics right there. That, that, <laughs> that's, that's a new form of... We will, we will use those for diacritical marks. These, and we'll skip a bit, these mutterings are not as widespread as the few proponents of the system imagine. The AD and D mag the D and D magic system is drawn drawn directly from chainmail. It was inspired by the superb writing of Jack Vance. Uh, it's it, it's just amazing to me that he, looking at this, sees what. Be and let's be honest. Read this and realize how much of this is now D and D. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep in mind also at the time the the thing that that kills me about this. It's not like D and D is a well-established, obvious, you know, huge presence in the the hobby's seven years old. Right. <laughs> this is okay. seventy-eight. It's it's not like there's you know three generations. I'm playing D and D the way Grandpa played it, you know, and handed it down to my dad who handed it. it no, right. <laughs> So this is this is D and D as played by our older brothers and taught to us at this point. Well, I mean, that's as far back well, as we're going. For me, I'm one year out from starting playing D and D at this point. I was going to start the next year. Um, I'm about is, three years out at this point. This is this is so. That's why I grabbed this article because this was this was Gary just going after all these alternatives to his system. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to find this. 
<laughs> I, I know I've got, it must have been torn out of a buddy's, you know, you used to do that when you didn't realize that these things would have value one day. Yeah, but, well, keep in mind that if everybody who had, you know, the Ryan Sandberg rookie card and everybody who had, you know, Avengers issue 118 or whatever had all kept them, they wouldn't have any value. You know, the, the fact that Absolutely. many of them were chucked in the trash or, you know, baseball cards used to make motorcycle noises and bicycle spokes in third grade, you know, it, that that is why the remaining ones do have the value they do. That is so great. Uh, why magic users and clerics cannot use swords. There you go. Uh, well, just can we just scroll up the page just a little bit there? Just just because that's my childhood scrolling by. Minifigs and limited. Yeah. All my early Napoleonics were from these guys. So these these are the guys that provided in the early in this, no, it's a middle generation because there's an earlier generation that goes to the '60s. But in this middle generation of which I was a very very late comer, uh, min, minifigs they were the stuff. Hey guys, miss you. <laughs> anyway, now magic users and why they can't do it. First of all, what a ridiculous and dumb statement. I mean, it's it. it they can't do it because the rules are written that if way. You want Thank you. That's I, I don't know any simpler way to put it. I mean, it's, yeah. you're going to try. Oh, oh my God! I just read the first line of the article. <laughs> it is, however, based on fact and logic. No, it's not. It's, it's, stop saying no. I cannot fly. Yeah, I'm incapable of flight, and yet D and D permits me to do so. So that's one of its appeals. So, so here is how I read this entire article. Um, I, and, and I'm sure you you've seen these guys. In, in all sorts of cartoons and in all sorts of movies, in the hip-hop world, it's the hype man behind the lead singer. And, and on our forums, it's, it's when Vincenzo shows up behind Herman Hum to, to pile on. Somebody gets up, makes a really big, forceful, impassioned argument, and the hype man comes up behind and goes, Yeah! <laughs> right? That's, that's yes. who these guys are. That's, that's Charles here. To Gary's screed over the past three pages, Charles showing up and going, "Yeah, oh, that's a good point." That's exactly that's what's going on there. He is, he he is the linebacker coming in for the late hit after the running back has been tackled. <laughs> he is piling on, hoping to get you know an extra crotch shot in there to cause the running back to go limping off, and he's going to take the flag just to get that extra hit in there. That's Charles with this article. That's what's going I mean, on there. And it's it, it this huge article, this this two columns is all about explaining once again a thought that I will confess never entered my mind that D and D was supposed to be somehow balanced. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's so bizarre. Yeah. Well, Not in the least. No, nor, nor nor do do I wish it to be so. Yeah. <laughs> um Origin seventy eight was the fourth annual National Wargaming Convention. Uh, Remember back when Origins was the National Wargaming Convention? I sure don't. Not vividly. I'm a Gen Con <laughs> guy, but I, I, apparently the record reflects that it was. Yeah, well, because for a lo the longest time, it was the, you know, the Avalon Hill House Convention there for a while. Right, um, right. But, you know, these days, uh, were it not... It, look, I... Okay, I probably do this more than I should anyway, but this particular time, we are going to toot our own horn. Let's face it, Wargaming might well have dried up and disappeared from, from Origins had we not kind of been jerks about, damn it, we need more Wargaming at Origins, and, and talked, you know, John and the Gamma guys to, to giving us the opportunity to bring it back. And, you know, kudos to those guys for giving us the latitude that we've had to make this happen. Um, but but Wargaming had, had dried up and withered away in the, the 10 years that I had been around Origins before we finally sort of, you know, stamped our feet and said, damn it, we need more Wargaming, and, and they gave us the opportunity to bring it back some. That's um, a great thing. And, and so, you know, now, you know, we're running 80-something events each weekend, uh, driving ourselves nuts doing it. But, you know, we, we've got some Wargaming back at the show, and so, so at least we've got that going on. It's not quite the National Wargaming Convention that it used to be, um, but we're, 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 we're getting there. Um, all right. Uh, Alpha Omega, there we go, no message ever followed from Battleline Publications. Exciting game of tactical space combat. I, I will say I have seen this, I certainly never played it. Nope. Um, saw it on the shelf. Saw I saw it on shelf. a table somewhere with somebody Did playing you? it. I, I never played it. Um. <laughs> the, uh, this is, 
extra thick cut back. Ooh. Light years of anything. Yeah. Good, good, good Metamorphosis yep. Alpha Modifications. And, because this is early role-playing world, guess what? We have an we have a chart. We have to have a chart. The and mutated and, and animal and chart. That, and notes for the chart over on the right. Yes. Uh, horse, deer, moose, mountain goat, black, or brown bear, separate from the grizzly bears. Mutated armadillos, in case you need an eight-legged armadillo bowling ball. Um, the boar, the elephant, the pygmy elephant. The raccoon, the skunk, the gorilla. I love old manual typeset letting because it looks like you have a skunk gorilla. Not a skunk or a gorilla, but a skunk gorilla. Um, skunk gorilla. Yeah. Uh, sea lions. Interestingly enough, no seals, but sea lions. Um, for canines, uh, they've got the coyote, wolf, fox, and mastiff, but no other domestic dogs. So, we have... And just you, you, you did you did skip past something promised to us in the uh, table of contents, the Gen Con update and preview. Oh, I was getting back to that. I, I come on, man. I wanted to make a cougar joke in there. With, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were about talking. cougars doing damage with both bite and claws. <laughs> I, I have no personal experience. I'll have to take that on your good authority. All right, the Gen Con update and preview. Um, Russian campaign players, sixteen in all will begin their tournament's first round in the afternoon. The Russian campaign being played at Gen Con. Who'd have thunk? Well, but not just that. John Edwards is judging. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's something we got to think about to see if we can get a designer to judge. we got to be able to do that. We get designers to show up and play. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how, many I would, the, I would, I would, how many of the games cool, have we gotten Mark Walker to jump into? Yeah, just, oh, there you go. Get Walker to judge a tournament. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, you... you you can't make the guys from Proving Ground go away when you're busy teaching their games. Well, that's true. They're good people. They are uh, they like hanging out and, and just talking about the stuff. But to, to have, because the other thing is, folks, you know, what we're, the games we're talking about, uh, Fields of Fire, uh, Mark Walker's games, you can play a reasonable semblance of the game in, in a two-hour window, including teaching time. Which you we have to do because that's all we've got for our windows. <laughs> right, right. With virtue being the mother of necessity or necessity being the, the, the father of invention. But the, the point being, Russian campaign? That that was not a short tournament. No. <laughs> that was not, not, not. And then, what was their new game? Oh, Magic, Magic Realm. Realm. That's on, that, that is going to fall into the list of those that if you tell me you've played it, you have to prove it to me. <laughs> I loved Magic Realm as a concept. It utterly defeated me as anything approaching fun. Well, and, and and I think the key there is that you have to prove that you've played it. Not that you own it, because plenty of people own it. But how many people oh, own yeah, it and I have played it? I think a billion people own that game. And nobody wants to... But notice at the bottom, the Strategist Club. The people who held that vote up top, they had a meeting. They had a banquet. And, and here we have, for Thursday, August 17th, 1978... The first showings of movies at Gen Con. Yes. Think now how 40 years later, what a central part of Gen Con movies, culture, pop culture, all that now is in Indianapolis. I mean, that's, uh, so, so this yeah. is where it began. These are some humble beginnings in Parkside. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. RuneQuest. There we go. The giant RuneQuest ad. Remember back when the... The big four role-playing games were D&D, RuneQuest, Tunnels and Trolls, and Traveler. When did, when did Chiasm become, or when, were, when did they stop being THE Chiasm? Uh, I don't know. They have a definite article in this ad. Yes. I just, I just, I'd never seen that before. Yeah. That's, hmm. Oh, I, I am delighted by the fact that under the All the World's Monsters, Volume 1 and 2, we have authentic thaumaturgy. Thank you for Isaac Bonowitz. Heaven for offend, we should have the inauthentic variety. <laughs> the uh, the Green Magician, the story that prompted Dragon to add four pages to this issue. Who is it by? El Sprague de Camp. Well, when you got the man, when you got one of the men, the real men writing, you give him some space. Yeah, you give him how many pages they damn well need. <laughs> yeah, was, I, yeah, he, that, that's how much does he get? As much as he wants. And, and you'll notice they illustrate the fiction; they don't illustrate the game components. <laughs> No, 
No, they actually went out and they said, hey, somebody, we got Ellsbury to camp, and, and they dug up whoever that is. It's not our guy. Yeah, but, somebody uh, find me a fifth grader to do the artwork. Uh, that's, <laughs> everybody, I want all the teachers, all the fifth graders in middle America to peer over the shoulders of their students while they're doodling. Are any of them drawing better than this? If so, have them contact. Yeah. So, uh, Wormy was around back then. Oh, yes. So, uh, Phineas Fingers. Uh, Phineas Fingers had had his moments. Uh, what's interesting is Phineas Fingers uh, was still a going uh, comic in, in, in into the 90s. So, uh, not necessarily in Dragon, but was still going into the 90s. Here we have a couple of the jumps from some of the uh, the previous articles earlier. Uh, some things that jumped back to here. Uh, there is our ad for Gen Con 11. Um, there's the wrap up of our Ninja article. No, as, yeah, but, but 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 see the special event at Gen Con. The Dungeon Championship. What the hell was that? What? What? In the blue. Well, because there were up to 256 players. God. They were that doing eight-player games, co-sponsored by Grenadier and TSR. I mean, that is just amazing to me. I look, I played it, I owned it, I played it a ton. I wore the little yellow cards out, but wow, that was the special event, huh? Okay. Well, when you got two hundred fifty-six players in it, that's kind of special. And it, and how many people can say they've out there? That paragraph at the bottom. First of all, let's skip ahead a little bit. Of course, Saturday will be opened by the traditional Dawn Patrol game of Fight in the Skies. Folks, that's still going on. <laughs> Every year, those guys fly that flag. So bless them always. 40 and years they, later. And, and may their planes never crash. Yes. Um, but skipping back to the top, they're also featuring Russian campaign. We talked about that. But African campaign. Yeah, I can't say I've ever seen an African campaign in the wild. Uh, not the Avalon Hill Vintage one, no. That's what I mean. Yes. Well, so because Compass was... Games just recently released the African campaign, and I don't know if it's a descendant, direct descendant of this or a reinvented one that's just you know got the name on it, because what the hell else are you going to call a game about the campaign in Africa? Um, right. But, but the, uh, you know, seen those plenty. Uh, but you're right. I don't know that I've ever seen the, you know, one of these uh, outside of a store shelf on occasion. So. And then, and then the, the four day pre reg, ten bucks. There you go, at the uh, door per day for five. <laughs> yep. So, um, all righty, here you go, Jim Ward talking game balance. I, what is going on here? Why Clearly, is there is a theme to this article. Haunting. Something happened. I'm being taunted at this point. Yes. When you know, somebody as semi awesome as Gary or Tim are telling you this that uh, this is uh, th this, it becomes very difficult for someone like me to do anything but nod my head in agreement. And maybe try to change the subject. <laughs> so yeah, I suspect James Ward is giving us a, uh, a counterpoint to the Gary Gygax screed earlier. Um, However, we're not going to zoom in and read the whole thing, and uh, you're just going to have to do this for yourself a little later. Yeah, but definitely, definitely, I am going to check this out, because some, because something happened, Volume 3, Number 2, to set the world on its edge. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, science fiction games from Metagaming. Olympica, GEV. Hey, baby. Show there we are. That, so. That's actually our back cover for this issue. Wow. We only had 40 pages. Uh, to run through, four of them were covers. So there were only 36 interior pages. If you think about it, that's nine sheets of paper, people. Yep. That This was not a very thick animal. Um, no, and they were... You could print this on cardstock and it's still going to not be a very thick uh, <laughs> thick magazine. How Steve Jackson was flailing around trying to make things work uh, when he was with metagaming. Notice that GEV includes a 24-page rulebook, counter set, a three-color, ooh, 12 by 14 map. But the price is three ninety-five. but three fifty if you're a subscriber to the Strategy Gamer. Or is that the Space Gamer? I think that's the Space Gamer. That was Steve's magazine later. Is that already here in 78? 
And, wow. and not only that, but we do have a handful of digital copies of Space Gamer Fantasy Gamer that perhaps we'll get to when we're done dragging up the past. Wow. That is... But we also... There it is. The, uh... Aw. Uh, oh, look, what, look what they offered at the dungeon. Look what they offered. Two floors of games and hobbies. Miniatures. Sand. Sand. Flat and board game tables. Now, I... I was at the dungeon back in the day. I'm more impressed right. by the fact they offered Ernie Gygax and crew. Yeah, apparently they guaranteed you that Ernie would be cruising around somewhere. Oh, poor Ernie. But um, the fact that they had sand tables. Yeah. Freaking sand tables. Hey, why not? Why and, not? Uh, yeah, one hour to Milwaukee. There it is. Booyah. All right, dragon number 16. Uh, what a great up. This is this is an A pluser. I oh, this old stuff makes me so happy. I could you know the fiction I can give or take, but oh, the, the meaty stuff here so great. The uh, the things that would have otherwise occupied multiple screens worth of message boards instead played out for posterity on paper with uh, Gary Gygax, his hype man, and the uh, the Jim Ward apology <laughs> tour in the back of the in the back of the issue. Oh, the hype man kills me. I, I love that James Ward gets consigned to like the very end of the magazine with his counterpoint. I'm assuming so it's a counterpoint. I haven't read it. I imagine if it hadn't it been is, a counterpoint, it is a, it is a slightly <laughs> deflected. I won't. He doesn't go right at him. Obviously, he's you know he does his three low kanjis because he knows he's in the presence of greatness. Yeah. But <laughs> it is it is absolutely him saying, "Hey, uh." And he seems to draw the conclusion that I shared earlier. How isn't this the job of the dungeon master? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, how isn't it the job of the dungeon master? You know, there's, and it's interesting now that I've thought about it. One of the big pieces that entered into Dungeons and Dragons in later years was encounter ratings. Yes. You know, the idea that you could auto balance the encounter, and I found that bizarre. Yeah. You can't. How stupid do you have to be to figure out? what it is that, you know, which, what's going to be too hard for your group and what's going to be too easy. What skills do you want them to have? What skills don't you want them to have? It's a shared storytelling experience. If you don't like what the rules are telling you, you paid for the rules. Say what you want. It's not a war game. Yeah. Do, do it your own way. And, and he seems to be very gently and very, in a very Tai Chi, not karate way, uh, saying just that. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's put a, stake through this one, send it to the grave, and uh, we will come back another time with yet another serendipitous exploration of a Dragon magazine to be named later. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jim. Thanks. This is fun. Always a good time.